Joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group hotline is one of those inside sources. He is the third-year head coach at East Carolina. Mike Schwartz joins the program. Mike, coach, appreciate you joining us this morning. Appreciate you guys having me, Paul. Thank you. So, coach, you roll into year three here. How can you get things clicking for your basketball team? You've been hovering around 500 your first two seasons here. What gets you to that next level to get you to the top of the AAC and competing with those Florida programs? Yeah, obviously that's the goal, without a doubt. When you talk about those Florida programs and so many other really strong programs in this conference, uh, but obviously with Florida Atlantic and South Florida have done here recently, um, you know, where we have to be, we have to be more consistent. That's the word we've used within our program. Um, I think consistency is key for us this season. Uh, I thought we were in a place to get close to turning the corner last year. In year two, uh, we're right there in the, the upper third to, to middle of the pack late in the season. Uh, we win three games in a row late in the season, and then we hit a skid, and we lose five in a row. Uh, and there, we kind of pick ourselves up going into the conference tournament, but consistency is the key, uh, and that that's where it's gonna, you know, that's where it's gonna fall this season, Paul. ECU men's basketball coach Mike Swartz join, join us this morning on the program alongside Paul Ihander. I'm Graham Hill, and Coach Swartz, I just want to go ahead and make you feel comfortable. I promise I'm not as nutty as our good friend of the program, Patrick Johnson, but hopefully I can ask just <laughs> as good of questions as he does. And I want to start with this: you mentioned last season. Pirates achieved the most wins in conference play. How do you plan to continue that trajectory in the 2024-25 season? Yeah, you know, and, and we are proud of that uh, in the first two seasons in terms of conference wins and, and wins on the road and wins in the conference tournament. But obviously it's not enough and it's not anywhere close to where we want to be. Um, I think one of the biggest, just from a statistical standpoint, that we have to uh, improve on is, is rebounding. Uh, we've been a good offensive rebounding team uh, in our first two seasons in Greenville, but an area that we have not been able to get over the hump uh, or, or so to speak, or, or be towards the top of the league is defensive rebounding. And that is an area we focused a great deal uh, this off season, this preseason. And as we head into just a few days away from the regular season beginning, but defensive rebounding is something, you know, we, we feel like we are establishing a defensive identity here in Greenville, uh, but you have to finish possessions with defensive rebounding. And, and that's an area in our first two seasons, we haven't been uh, pleased with where we've been. And then on the offensive side, Graham, we want to continue to be a little bit more efficient from behind the arc and in transition. Uh, you know, again, we've, we've been strong offensive rebounding, but I say it quite often, uh, I'll, I'll trade a few of those offensive rebounds in for made shots. And sometimes you're a good offensive rebounding team because you don't shoot a high percentage. And that's kind of where we were the last two seasons. And we're hopeful with this personnel, this ball club, with our style of play, uh, we really feel confident going into this season in, in those two areas. And we know the AAC can be certainly a challenge. You talk about multiple bids, and both Graham and I have both touched on getting your team to that next level past this 500 mark where you find yourselves. And I remember, Coach, when you took this job, you said ECU checked all the boxes, recruiting, support, uh, the the idea of being in a basketball-rich area. How much does that play into the kind of the pressure that you may feel personally about making sure that this team – your your first head coaching position under the Rick Barnes coaching tree, that this is a success not just for you but for this program as well. Yeah, absolutely, and that's a great point. And you know what? All that still stands true. The only thing that is different uh, from two years ago is the recruiting landscape is totally different uh, in terms of just when you look at regions or basketball-rich area or recruiting bases because of the portal and because of NIL, it has obviously changed quite a bit in terms of the blueprint for recruiting. But everything else, the support, the incredible administration, John Gilbert, Ryan Robinson, Chancellor Philip Rogers, the leadership here, and this incredible fan base, uh, the, the, the pirate fan base in terms of the support for ECU, you know, w whether I was at a rich place like that or not, I would put immense pressure on myself uh, to be successful as a head coach, to be successful as a, a basketball program. But you, you want it even more for a place like East Carolina that has not necessarily tasted that basketball success uh, that it has in, in some of the other sports, football, baseball, uh, women's basketball here recently. So, uh, yes, an immense amount of pressure we put on ourselves as a coaching staff, and I do directly on my shoulders uh, because we want ECU and Greenville uh, to really experience great basketball and experience a winning team. And, you know, what? it's very possible here, and we're going to do it. 
Of course, the Pirates tip off the 2024-25 season this upcoming Monday, November 4th at Menji's Coliseum as they take on NC Wesleyan at 7 p.m. Coach Swartz is joining us on Next Up this morning. And, Coach, I just want to touch on one of your key players when looking at your roster, senior guard R.J. Felton. He was named All-AAC preseason first-team selection. What does his leadership and performance mean to the team? And it seems like he's sort of the, the needle mover for your offense. Yeah, he's a, he's a heart and soul guy, Graham, and, and I would say that, and you just said it, uh, his leadership and what he means to this team, it's because he really embodies consistency. And that, again, that's what we're trying to get our whole program to and, and all of our players in terms of that kind of success. But consistency, the, the word I used earlier, is what he does. He brings it every day. He's a consistent person on and off the court. I've said this to our local media here quite a bit, as good of a player as he is. He's even a better person and teammate. And so the way he is with his guys in the locker room, on the court, what he brings from a physical standpoint every day, and as much as anything, I'd say this in this new era or climate of college basketball, what ECU and Greenville means to him, how much pride he takes in the purple and gold is what makes him special. And you know what? He's earned every bit of this to be one of the top players in college basketball going into this season. Coach, you touched on the word consistency, and I know that's 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 a lot of uh, a lot of themes for a lot of coaches across this country as we you know begin this new college basketball season. And you mentioned last year towards the end of the season that you went on that five game slide. What was missing in that? Because it felt like you guys and you just mentioned it. You were on that precipice of turning that corner, and you just couldn't quite get over that big hurdle. What was what was missing from your team in that in that five game? a losing streak that you and your staff learned from and your players were able to take something away from that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a great point. You know, I go back into early in the year. We lose a heartbreaking game uh, versus North Texas at the buzzer. Uh, in, in our building, literally, uh, they, they make an incredible play at the end of the game. They throw a home run pass. The kid catches it and he lays it in, and we lose that game. Uh, we come back and we go to UAB, a team that obviously won our conference tournament, and we play really, really well for 35 minutes, and we end up losing that game. So we had hit some adversity right there, but we bounced back. We came back and won two in a row. We went to Wichita State and won. We beat Temple in overtime at home. And so we got ourselves back on a roll. We win three in a row, the first three-game winning streak that ECU has had in conference since they joined the American Conference. And we're headed to the road to play Rice on the road. And you know what? That's where we start that five-game losing streak. And what was missing was I think I don't think we handled that three-game winning streak very well, to be quite honest. I think as a ball club, we had won three in a row for the first time. I think this program, we were right there chomping to try and be in the top maybe four, five, six in the league at that point going into it. And we had Memphis coming into our building after that game at Rice. And we did not play well at all in Houston. And it kind of spiraled from there. We tried to pick ourselves off the mat at SMU late in the season. We lost in, in a really gut-wrenching overtime game. And you know what? It just kind of, the word is, it kind of snowballed on us in that last, in that last stretch of the season. Uh, we felt like we had a chance to, to really be in the top four or five in the league where we were. And we didn't handle it very well as a ball club. And I think we've learned from it. And we expect to be in that position this year. And, and you know what? I'll be honest with you, we'll handle it a lot better as a team. I really do believe so. Final question for ECU head basketball coach Mike Swartz joining us on next. So really appreciate your time. And I just want to do some housekeeping because when I listened to your interview with Patrick Johnson on 94.3 The Game yesterday, I, I discovered that you guys are doing a little bit of a Black Friday sale. And on November 29th, after ECU football takes on Navy at noon, fans with tickets to the football game can walk over to Menji's Coliseum for an in-state matchup against North Carolina A&T. So how excited are you about that? And also, just look at the schedule. you got some good games against UNCW, and then you go down to South Carolina. Just your makeup of the schedule for this season, Coach. Yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that up, Graham. Thank you. And, you know, I'm very excited. And it starts with November 1st with, with, with North, North Carolina Wesleyan on November 4th. I mean, that this tip-off Monday night, uh, college basketball season is less than a week away. It's such a great time of year, the last week of October. But when we look at our Coastal Carolina coming in after that, you know, in our first weekend home game on November 9th, and one of the special things about Greenville, and, and we talk about it here with Patrick and, and our people here, is that this – 
they come to support ECU. It doesn't matter what sport. It doesn't matter what team that's coming in. It could be the number one team in the nation coming in like we've had come into our building with Houston before, or it could be any team coming in. And I think Pirate Nation really looks at the Pirates. They don't necessarily look at the opponent. So when I think about that game that you alluded to, the, the football doubleheader, when we play Navy that afternoon and we get North Carolina A&T that afternoon, I think, or that evening, I should say, I think it's a really great thing for this community and for this fan base. But I, I really hope it starts on, on Monday, November 4th, with North Carolina Wesleyan coming in, because this atmosphere in Minji's Coliseum, when it's going, is really an electric place. And it's a fun place to be. And, you know, we're looking forward to the season tipping off on Monday. East Carolina head coach Michael Schwartz joining us here on Next Up here on 99.9 The Fan. I know when you left Tennessee, a lot of the boards were using expletives when you left and in a good way. Hopefully, Coach, you can uh, put some of those good way expletives to use uh, as your uh, team gets kicked off here in this new season. Well, well, I really appreciate you saying that. And you know what? Last week of October, basketball season starting. The Dodgers are up three games to zero. Yes, they are. Win a World Series. Yes, they uh, are. You know, could, couldn't couldn't be a final better week of October for us. So I appreciate you guys having me. All right, Coach. Good luck this season. Hopefully, we can catch up. Thank you. All right, Head Coach Michael Schwartz, East Carolina Pirates. Uh, here on uh, ninety nine nine, the fan. Appreciate his honesty, uh, true honesty, and. Real straight shooter. And we get that from all the coaches that we have here on the program. Uh, you know, we had it with Coach Keats last week. We've had it with head coach Rod Brindamore before and others who have been on this program. Uh, real good to be able to dive into to basketball with him. And, you know, we live in college basketball country. And I didn't bring it up. I didn't bring it up. He brought it up. Dodgers are 3-0 and in the World Series. Just saying. he's a Beverly. He, he grew up in L.A. Beverly Hills kid. I was born out there too, so we're we're in our fields. I may have to start texting him a little bit more, Coach. Man, well, what happened? When I was just on the phone with him doing a little send off, he said that he might have some courtside seats for us at a uh, Menji's College Seymour that we're always welcome to. Again. See, Paul, that's that good old Eastern North Carolina hospitality that I'm always telling you about, Paul. <laughs> Down there in pirate country. Stop it! Stop. <laughs> Uh, good time though. Appreciate that. Like again, I appreciate his on- appreciated his honesty, and uh, look forward to seeing ECU. I remember that game. I you know we ran at a time with coaches. We do interviews and things like this. Uh, I remember watching that Memphis game because oh they, it gosh. was on national TV because it was like Memphis playing ECU and just blunk the half court buzzer. Just, yep, Patrick Johnson's famous call on ESPN Plus. Yeah, Pirates win. Pirates win. Yep. Holy mackerel! Pirates win. Holy mackerel! Is that a thing in Greenville? They have mackerel there? That's a mackerel? No, they don't. Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 99.9 The Fan. Game four of the World Series is tonight between the L.A. Dodgers and the New York Yankees. The Dodgers currently have the Yankees in a stranglehold with a 3-0 series lead and are looking to clinch the title tonight. First pitch scheduled for 8:08. Duke Coaches Show is live tonight from the Duke Washington Inn located in Durham. Head football coach Manny Diaz and host David Shoemate recap the Blue Devils' overtime loss to SMU this past weekend and preview Manny Diaz' return to number 5 Miami this weekend. Our local sports coverage continues at noon with the Adam Gold Show, followed by The Drive with Tim Donnelly from 3 to 6. You can stream both shows live by visiting the fans' YouTube channel. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, and never miss a play. And as always, you can find these stories and more on WRLSportsFan.com. All right, very quickly, this is the true story of 17 teams picked to play in a conference, work together, and have their games taped. Find out what happens when teams stop being polite and start getting real. This is the real world ACC. Mac Brown spoke to the media talking about that blowout win over Virginia. I've said all along this is a team that I thought would keep getting better, and we showed that Saturday. Um, that, that's the best we've played as a game, as a team, the entire game since Minnesota. And Minnesota's turned out to be a really good team. 
as I said, their quarterback's playing well. They they jumped all over Maryland this weekend. They beat USC. They're uh, they're they're having a, a tremendous year. Um, but the guys played free. They they played loose. I thought they had fun. They looked like they had confidence, and that's something that we haven't seen for an entire game for a while. So one down and five to go. Florida State, Wake, Boston College, NC State. Probability, Graham, of Carolina finishing out the season with five straight wins. Well, according to some of their fan base, after the blowout went to Virginia, some are saying they don't see another loss on the schedule. And when that 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 could be true, I know a lot of Carolina fans are going to circle the state game and say that's the one that's a coin toss, but... Can I say something that might that make me that might make me look I make me look like I have three eyes? I think the Florida three? I think the Florida State game is more dangerous than the state game. Yeah, Florida State is playing okay football again. Not great football. They're not playing bowl football. That's for sure. They're not going to make it. They 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 have they have mathematically eliminated themselves from doing so. Hey, the Tar Heels. Tar Heels situation is going to be about how its coach feels about his players. I said it, at the and begin- how much confidence he has in them at this point. I said it at the beginning of the season, and I will stand on this hill until it crumbles. But underneath me, the Florida State game is the make it or break it game for Carolina football season. So, with the ACC and the few moments we have left here coming up on Saturday, the big matchup is Pitt and SMU. We just saw SMU go toe to toe with Duke. I'm not sure SMU has the horses, no pun intended, because they are the Mustangs, to stay with Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has a defense that all of a sudden is proving itself worthy, and it has a quarterback that they don't have to lean on as much who's a freshman. SMU played Duke so close, and Duke is a good football team. Not a ranked football team, but a pretty good football team. And Duke going to Miami, obviously, and we'll chop that up throughout the week here too. But I think when the ACC rolls around, if you're going to be real, and you look at the top of this, you look at the top of where this where these standings are in the ACC, like Pitt is the real deal. Pitt could be the odd team left out. Everyone says it could be SMU. Pitt could be the odd team left out of Clemson and Miami going to the college football expanded playoff. I don't know, Paul. Apparently we were wrong yesterday when we said that Duke dominated SMU all weekend in their game because outside of SMU's six turnovers, they dominated that game. You know, I would think a team's defense forcing another team's offense to six turnovers would count as the definition of dominating them in a football game. Wouldn't you agree? It would if you could capitalize on those turnovers. Well, you didn't have to point that out. But. <laughs> yeah, listen, a little salt, a little salt on the slug is not going to hurt anybody. I mean, except the slug. And Duke turned out to be the slug. And then Stanford might not leave to go back to California after they experienced Bojangles Cookout and uh, Parker's <laughs> Barbecue this weekend. There'll be a full a full comparison of all the fast food hamburgers when Stanford plays at State. Noon kickoff. Lots of noon kickoffs. Duke-Miami kicking off at noon, too. At least you get a little bit of a break between Carolina and Florida State.